This video is sponsored by Card Kingdom. You can visit their store by using my referral link in the description below. Hi everyone, I'm Nita Hone, and it's time for another MTG Top 10, the series where I rank cards based on their historical performance and Magic's highest level of competition. Today, we're going to look at cards from Mirage. It's been a while since I've done an MTG Top 10 on a set, so it seemed like a good time to do another one. I've also looked at every set from before Mirage came out, so it made sense to do this one. Mirage came out in 1996, and it's one of the most important sets in the history of Magic, as it marked a huge shift in a number of different ways. For one thing, it was the first set that was designed to be part of a block. This is the way they released Magic sets for about 20 years. This meant that there were multiple sets that took place in the same setting, and they were mechanically and flavorfully interlinked. It also meant that the three sets in Mirage block, which are Mirage, Visions, and Weatherlight, were meant to be drafted and played together in Constructed. Mirage was also the first set to be designed with limited play in mind, and it was really the first set to introduce lore as we think of it today, where it tells some story over the course of several sets. If you're interested in hearing me go even deeper on what makes Mirage so groundbreaking, check out my top 10 on the most important sets in the history of Magic. That said, despite being important, I do think Mirage has something of a bad reputation. This isn't something I've helped with, as Mirage cards do tend to show up on most of my worst lists. Make no mistake, there are some truly awful cards in Mirage, but I think the set as a whole is underrated. When we look at it as a whole, there are several cards that made a huge impact on competitive magic, and there are several that are still very relevant cards today. To be eligible for this list, a card had to receive its original printing in Mirage. In all, there were 313 cards eligible for this list, and in this video, we'll look at the 10 that have left the biggest impact on competitive magic. Before we get started, here's a quick reminder on how I score cards in these videos. A first tier top 8 is worth 2 points, this includes events like Pro Tours, and a second tier top 8 is worth 1 point, this includes events like Regional Championships. At number 10, it's Hammer of Bogarden. It costs 1 generic and 2 red, and it's a sorcery that does 3 damage to any target. You can also pay 2 generic and 3 red to return it from your graveyard to your hand, but you can only activate it during your upkeep. 3 mana for 3 damage at sorcery speed can be a pretty effective card, especially in formats of smaller card pools, like block and standard. Then, the late game upside this offers can be pretty massive. Sure, paying 5 to get it back isn't an amazing deal, but it also isn't a bad place to spend your excess mana once you're in top deck mode. Basically, it provides really good flood insurance, because you'll be able to do something with your mana every turn. The hammer gained all of its points in block and standard, usually appearing in red aggro decks. It doesn't have any points since 2003, but there also aren't that many other cards from Mirage that are close to it and seeing significant play these days, so it may hold on to a spot on this list for a while. At number 9, it is Serene Heart. For one generic and a green, it's an instant that destroys all auras. The original card says local enchantments, because back then aura wasn't a subtype yet, but trust me, the card says destroy all auras in Oracle. Anyway, this can be an amazing card against opponents who are really reliant on auras. There just aren't very many cards out there that target auras specifically and can destroy multiples so efficiently. This has led to it being a really important sideboard card in Popper, a format where only commons are legal. One of Popper's best decks looks to play creatures with hexproof like Slippery Bogle and slap a bunch of auras on them. While it is hard to deal with the Bogle itself because it has hexproof, Serene Heart lets you get rid of all those auras, and once they're gone, the Bogle isn't exactly intimidating. With Serene Heart, you can even get rid of them at instant speed and block the Bogle. Serene Heart has gained all of its points in Popper, and it's going to keep gaining points in the format going forward, so it has a great chance at continuing to move up this list. At number 8, it is Rampant Growth. This is one of the more well-known cards in Mirage, partly as a result of being reprinted a ton. I think it's the first card many people think of when they think of a green ramp spell. For one generic into green, it's a sorcery that lets you search your library for a basic land and put it onto the battlefield tapped. On subsequent turns, this means you're going to be a mana ahead of your opponent, and thus able to play out more powerful cards before they can. Growth didn't get any points as a result of its original printing, but it has gained points in Standard and Extended as a result of subsequent reprints. Unsurprisingly, it's largely seen play in ramp decks like Jund and Scapeshift. It doesn't have any points since 2012, but that could change if it ever gets another Standard Legal reprint. 
At number 7, it's Wildfire Emissary. It has the same total score as Rampant Growth, but more first tier top 8s, so I gave it the higher spot on the list. This 2 4 costs 3 generic and a red, and it comes with protection from white. It can also raise its power for 1 generic and a red. It was played in 4 of the top 8 decks at the Mirage Block Pro Tour, all of which were aggro decks. The stat line here certainly doesn't look aggressive to us today, but against opponents playing white, the Emissary was really hard to deal with, and it could actually hit pretty hard when it needed to. It's also gained some points in Standard, in both Aggro and Control decks, and it gained several points in Extended in 1997, where it was a sideboard card that Control decks used. The Emissary then went quiet for a really long time, until it got a time-shifted reprint in Time Spiral, it gained another Top 8 in that Standard format in a Boros Aggro deck, and it has a single Legacy Top 8 from 2005. The Emissary has a pretty impressive multi-format resume, but it hasn't gained a single point since 2007. Even a standard legal reprint probably wouldn't result in it finding a ton of success. Creatures these days just tend to be much more powerful. At number 6, it is Seeds of Innocence. For one generic and two green, it's a sorcery that destroys all artifacts. The controller of each of those artifacts gains life equal to the total mana value of the artifacts they lose. This is the most efficient way to sweep the board of all artifacts, so even if it lets your opponent gain some life, it's a pretty attractive card in the right metagame, and Legacy, right now, is the right kind of artifact-heavy metagame, so it sees significant play in the format. It also sees some more sporadic play in Vintage, and it looks likely that it's going to keep gaining points in the future. At number 5, it is Floodplain. It's part of a cycle of fetch lands that all enter the battlefield tapped, and they can be tapped and sacrificed to search up a land with one of two types, and it gets put on the battlefield. Note, by the way, that it does not enter tapped. That helps make up for the fact that the plane itself enters tapped. While it is part of a cycle, this is the only card in that cycle that has enough points to make this list. It gained almost all of its points in Extended, where it could be used to grab dual lands like Savannah and Plateau. When dual lands are around, fetch lands become a pretty amazing source of fixing for decks that are more than two colors. However, it has obviously been outshined by the fetch lands from Onslaught Block, which are much better. They do the same thing, except they enter untapped and they make you pay one life. Paying that one life is well worth the upgrade, so it hasn't gained any points in quite some time. At number 4, I've got two cards, Mystical Tutor and Enlightened Tutor. They would have been number 4 and number 5 anyway, and they're very similar cards that are part of the same cycle. Both are one mana instants that let you tutor up a card and put it on top of your library. Mystical Tutor grabs instants or sorceries, and Enlightened Tutor grabs enchantments or artifacts. Obviously, this type of tutor is weaker than the kind that puts them directly into your hand. After all, it's card disadvantage. You give up a card and you never get a full card back, but... When you cast one of these, you do know the next card you draw is likely to be a card you really need from your deck. Plus, since they are instants, you can use them at the end of your opponent's turn and then just draw the card on your draw step. Mystical Tutor has a distinction of being played in what is arguably Magic's first combo deck ever, Prosperous Bloom, a Mirage Block constructed deck that sought to use Cadaverous Bloom and Squandered Resources and card draw spells to produce stupid amounts of mana and then cast a lethal Drain Life. The deck only ran one or two copies of Drain Life because you didn't really want to draw it when you could be drawing more lands or card draw spells, and you could use the tutor to grab it once you had the mana you needed. In Standard, it was played some in Replenish combo decks because, like a lot of tutors, it could serve as additional copies of that key card. It was also used in combo decks that used Mana Severance to get rid of all of your lands and then activate Goblin Charbelcher. In Legacy, it's been used in other combo decks built around instants and sorceries like those interested in using Flash or Ad Nauseum. In Vintage, it's capable of searching up pieces of the Power 9 like Time Walk or Ancestral Recall, not to mention cards with Storm. These days, Mystical Tutor is banned in Legacy and restricted in Vintage, but it is likely to keep gaining points in Vintage in the future. Enlightened Tutor doesn't have quite as impressive of a history as, on average, grabbing an artifact or enchantment isn't quite as good as an instant or sorcery. Unlike Mystical Tutor, it is fully legal in both Legacy and Vintage. It's helped to power combo decks that are reliant on cards with these particular types. For example, in Legacy, it's been used to search up both halves of the Painter-Grindstone combo, and in Vintage, it can be used to find Oath of Druids. It's likely to keep gaining points going forward. There is a third tutor in the set. It's Worldly Tutor, which costs one green mana and tutors up a creature and puts it on top of your library. But it didn't have enough points to make the list, so that's why I'm not really talking about it here.
At number 3, it is Wall of Roots. This 0-5 with Defender costs 1 generic into green, and once a turn, you can choose to put a minus 0, minus 1 counter on it to add 1 green mana to your mana pool. Its high toughness can help you live long enough to take advantage of all the mana it can produce for you. It was played both times it was in standard, in ramp decks as you would expect. It was also played in a variety of extended decks, including Life from the Loam and The Rock. It also has a single point in Legacy from back in 2005 when it was played in a recurring survival deck. Modern, though, is where it's found the most consistent success. It was played in most versions of Birthing Pod, a toolbox deck that also ran some easy-to-assemble combos, and the wall was nice for the deck because it could be used to help you go off with the pod a turn sooner, and then you could sacrifice it to the pod once its usefulness was done. Birthing Pod was eventually banned in Modern, but Wall of Roots has continued seeing play in its spiritual successor, which is a toolbox deck that runs Collected Company and Court of Calling instead of the pod. It also appears in popper wall combo decks, and that's actually where it's seeing the most play these days. It's likely to keep gaining points, and it has some chance to catch the number two card on the list. For now, though, that number two card is Dissipate. For one generic and two blue, Dissipate is an instant that counters a spell and then exiles that spell. While there are lots of more efficient counter spells out there, the fact this has exile upside does matter against opponents who are playing graveyard-oriented decks. Like Rampant Growth, it's been reprinted a ton, and it's actually legal in Standard right now. It's gained almost all of its points in the various Standard formats it's been legal in. It can't really break into other formats that just have better counterspells than this. However, they do like reprinting this, and that means it has a pretty good chance at gaining more points in the future, though we'll probably never catch the number one card on the list, which is... Lion's Eye Diamond. This card was originally printed because they wanted to create a fixed version of Black Lotus. In other words, they wanted to print a weaker version. At first glance, it might seem that they really succeeded. It costs zero mana, and you can sacrifice it for three mana of any one color, but you also have to discard your hand. However, over the years, people have found ways to turn discarding their hand into upside, so there are lots of situations where you can negate the downside, and there are some situations where Lion's Eye Diamond is just better than Black Lotus. This was especially true with the way Lion's Eye Diamond originally worked. For a while, you could sacrifice it for the mana and still cast things from your hand before you discard it. This was the most busted alongside Yawgmoth's Will, a sorcery that costs two generic into black and lets you play cards from your graveyard. You could get the mana from Lion's Eye Diamond, cast Yawgmoth's Will, and then discard your hand. Then you could replay the diamond after that and get three more mana. And usually this just meant you could cast your whole graveyard. They did eventually nerf the diamond, so you had to discard your hand before you ever had a chance to use the mana. But if you cast Yawgmoth's Will and then sacrifice the diamond, you still end up with some absurd upside. Yawgmoth's Will is only one example of a way to abuse the diamond. There are lots of other ones out there. So, yeah. Turns out... Getting 3 mana for 0 mana is still really good, even with something that's supposed to be a downside tacked onto it. This not only led to Lion's Eye Diamond getting a Rodham, it also ended up getting banned or restricted in every single format, though these days it is legal in Legacy, and that's the format where it's gained the most points and played the most significant role. It mostly sees play there in Storm decks. It's going to continue to be the number one card on this list for the foreseeable future. So, those are the top 10 cards from Mirage. If you want to own any cards from this underrated set, check out the description where you can find a direct Card Kingdom link for each card that appeared in the video. If you want to make sure you catch future videos, don't forget to subscribe. If you want to catch up on past videos, you should see some playlists on your screen shortly. And if you want to go the extra mile in supporting me and the channel, you can do that by becoming a channel member or a patron. You can find ways to do those things in the description. Thanks for watching.